Amen. You guys haven't seen anything yet. No kidding. I got a scripture for somebody today, probably for all of us. Psalm 16, verse 8, it says that I know the Lord is with me and I will not be shaken for he is beside me. I think if we're being shaken in any area of our life, it's because we don't know that the Lord is always with me. If I am being shaken, if you are being shaken in any circumstance, I don't care what circumstance it is, then you don't know and understand that the Lord is always with you. The Lord, you want to know who God is? I think, I think um, Sarah spoke about this, how God himself in the palm of his hands, in the palm of his hand, holds the galaxies. That God is with you. So when we understand and when we have a revelation of God is with us, we will not be shaken. We need a revelation of the almighty God, the one that created the universe, the one that spoke you into existence, that he is with you. Yes, you do. Because we will not be shaken. Let the earth be shaken. Let everything that can be shaken be shaken, but we cannot be shaken because we are of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And if you know that the Lord is with you, in you, beside you, behind you, in front of you, in you, on you, then there's no reason that you can be shaken. Amen? Amen? We need to remind ourselves constantly that the Lord is in me, on me. Remember, he's in me, for me, upon me, for the world. Amen? We're living in a time that is, what would be a good word? Crazy, let's do that. That works. We're living in a season, in a, in a time that is, we, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, right? I, I want to read another, another thing. I'll get to my message, hopefully. It says this. In Psalm 139, it says, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. This is telling me that God himself knitted you in your mother's womb. You were not an accident. You were not a mistake. While you were being formed in your mom's womb, God already decided your purpose. Do you know that God, I'm going to step on some toes and God help me, Jesus, you guys just bear with me. Let me read another. You watched as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book, and every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. While you were being formed in your mother's womb, it was not an accident. God himself was creating you. I know that it takes an egg and a sperm to come together and to form a being. And, but God himself determined, listen to me, determined your gender while you were in the womb, before you even came out of the womb. Your gender was determined by God Almighty, the God of the universe, the one that spoke the earth into existence, the one that holds the galaxies in the palm of his hand. He determined that you would be a male or a female with a purpose with a destiny, with something incredible to do for him. Amen. You don't have to question if you are a cat or a dog or a male or a female. That is on your birth certificate. Go and take a look at it. If it says girl, you are female. If it says boy, you are a male. And you were designed and determined and destined to do something amazing and mighty for God. Because before you even thought of yourself, 
Before your parents even thought of yourself, God already said, that one is mine and I'm going to use him for my glory. I don't know what in the world is going on in the world. But the church better rise up and they better know the truth. That They better speak the truth because when the world is going to fall apart, and it will, they're going to turn to us because we're going to have the answers. And we better know what the answer is. No double-minded, no back and forth. We know who we are. We know who he is. We know what it is, and we're going to say it. Amen? Amen. I believe that Romans 12, 2 says this, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. The church has toddled back and forth, and we have disobeyed this word because we have conformed to the ideals of this world. We have given in because we don't want to hurt or offend people. We better start hurting and offending people out of love. Because there's a world that is dying and going to hell because we don't want to give the truth because we don't want to offend. So then we just let them go to hell. We need to know what the Bible says. That we were created in the image of God for a purpose. Amen? Amen. Yes. Amen. That was not even my message, but thank you, Jesus. I'm just going to share something that I shared. We had an IMA conference. You guys, some of you guys were here for that. And um, I had the opportunity to share on unity. And I think it is really important because um, unity is something that we haven't really seen much, correct? Right. Unity is, um, let's see if I can find the definition of it, if I even put the definition on here. Maybe I didn't. I think we think of unity as being um, like we're all in agreement, we're all on the same page, yeah? But we can be in unity and have different opinions. Did you guys know that? I say this a lot. You know, we have, we have a lot of people. This, this, one, <laughs> this one time, we, had, um, we used to have blue, uh, blue chairs, and we had burgundy carpet, and we had that wall was pink, and the rest of the walls were white. And, you know, I never noticed it. I never noticed it. And I had a friend that was gonna that was gonna come and kind of help us, you know, like she's like an interior decorator, or whatever. So she walks in and she goes, Oh my God, Char, what are you guys doing? I'm like, what? It's like you got a pink wall, blue chairs, and purple carpet. And I'm like, oh, that doesn't match. <laughs> so anyway, so this was when we first took over. So I thought, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna paint the church. So we painted it. I think it was like a yeah, gold, you know, because the gold was in. So I thought I'm just gonna paint it gold because it kind of matches the floor, kind of matches the whatever, you know. And so I um, had a couple people say, well, I don't really like the gold. You know, we should have done this. We should have done that. And I said, well, I didn't really ask your opinion. <laughs> can you imagine asking everybody's opinion on what color that we, should, that we should paint? But we can be in unity on the same page but have different opinions. You guys get that? I'm just going to, can I just read this? Unity is... Unity is this, is something that the world is very far from, and I fear that the church is as well. I have never seen in all of my life the church being so divided on issues that don't really matter, that shouldn't matter, right? You have COVID, right? Wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Get the vaccine, don't get the vaccine. I'm not, I'm for whatever, whatever you want to do with it, that is up to you, right? You want to do it, do it. Should the churches open, the churches don't open. There's all of these, there's all of these things that are going on that is causing the church to be divided, and it shouldn't be. Jesus said in John 17, he was talking. He was praying, actually, and he was praying to his father, and he was like, Lord, God, Father, God, somebody up there, 
I want them to be one as you and I are one. Let them be one as you and I are one. In other words, the, the Bible says in 1 John, it says that the world will know the Father by our love for each other. The world will know God's love by our love for each other. I hate it when churches are in competition. That was never God's design to be in competition. I look at, I look at churches as tribes. It's like each church has a vision and a purpose. And each one should do what God has called you to do. We need to do what God has called us to do. Don't you agree? We are doing what God is calling us to do. And we are making an impact on our area. Amen? And I believe that if we were, if the churches were not so concerned about what other churches are doing, they would make an impact on their area as well. Amen? Each one of us are called to do something completely different, but with one purpose. And what is that purpose? Jesus. Amen? Saving people from hell. Jesus said, repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Go heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. And then he said, make disciple of all nations. How do you do that? Bring them to a cell group. The church, unfortunately, has jumped on the same wagon. And like I said, we've disobeyed the word of God and we've conformed to the world. And we haven't, we haven't been the steadfast thing that the world needs. And God is calling us. He's not calling us. He's commanding us to arise and to shine because his glory is upon us for a reason and for a purpose. Amen? That reason and that purpose is the world 100%, now more than ever, needs Jesus. Jesus is the hope of the nations. Nothing else is hope. No program is hope. No government assistance. No, nothing brings hope to a nation except Jesus. That's why God said, I love the world so much that I'm going to send my son to die to give them life and to give them a hope and a purpose. Amen? Unity is the soil for vision and submission is the fertilizer. Honor is where vision grows. Unity in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, remember in Acts chapter 2, Jesus says to go and to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. You guys remember that story? And it says that they were all in one accord. And then the Holy Spirit came. As I was reading that, I thought, you know, the miracle was not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was the promise of the Father. The miracle was they were all in one accord. Could it be that the Holy Spirit is attracted to unity? Could it be that the Holy Spirit, that unity was that was that that thing that the Holy Spirit could come and fall upon? Could it be that unity is the foundation for the Holy Spirit to come and fall? So if that's the case, then what do you think discord attracts? (laughs) Being in unity is this. Say honor. Honor. Say honor. Honor. We have to learn honor. How we honor each other. Honor each other's gifts. Honor each other's other's differences. I love what Bill Johnson says. He says, honor is seeing in somebody something that they're not. Does that make sense? He says, you see in somebody the thing that they can be even when they're acting the opposite of what they should be. Right? Honor and unity go hand in hand. So as we understand that we are called as a church 
to be a light to the world. In Isaiah 60, it says that we are to arise and to shine because his glory is upon us, upon you, upon the church, not for you, but for the world. Remember, his glory comes upon us. His Holy Spirit is upon us. That's what happened in the book of Acts. Unity attracted the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon them and they became witnesses. So when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, it's not so we can get goose pimples and roll on the floor, although that's fun, or fall over, but it comes upon us for a purpose. Say purpose. And the purpose is to be a witness to our area. Be a witness to the one next to you at work. Be a witness to the one at the grocery store. Be a witness to the one at drags or at Casa or at can't be Mandarin anymore because they closed. So sad. So sad. <sighs> Let me read something to you. Romans 12, 9 says this. It says, uh, let the inner movement of your heart always be to love one another and never play the role of an actor wearing a mask. Despise evil and embrace everything that is good and virtuous. Be devoted to tenderly loving your fellow believers as members of one family and try to outdo yourselves in respect and honor of one another. Be enthusiastic to serve the Lord, keeping your passion toward him boiling hot radiate the, the glow of the Holy Spirit and let him fill you with excitement. Say excitement. Excitement. excitement to serve you. See, I believe this, that excitement comes when we honor one another. Passion is ignited when we learn to honor in unity. I think, I'm, I, think I might be on to something, Right? I believe that God is wanting to stir a passion. He wants to awaken his body. He wants to awaken the church to understand what we are called and designed to do, that you were called and designed with the purpose. There is a purpose in your life. You were designed to do something great. Just like I said to the worship team, inside of them are songs. Do you know inside of you is seeds? Inside of you are books. Some of you in here, God is called to write books. Some of you, inside of you, God has called you to be a president of your company or to start your own company. There's purposes and things inside of you that you, you just kind of don't think that you can do because you don't see it big enough. I always say this, that if, you're, if, things, you, if you can do things on your own, then they're not from God. We need to dream big because inside of you, God has planted and put things inside of you to do. You don't just wake up in the morning and just exist. There's something greater because God has purposed it and he's put it in you. Dream big. What do you want to do? What is it that, write that book. Who in here God has been speaking to to write a book? Okay, listen, if he has, listen, if he has called you to write a book and you don't write the book, then you don't, then you, okay. The th here, you guys listen. The book is not for you. When an apple tree grows up to be an apple tree, the apple tree does not eat his apples. If he does, then cut it down and burn it because it's a weird apple tree. <laughs> Who eats the apples off the apple tree? People do. The book inside of you is not for you. It's for the people that you were designed to touch. Amen? The songs that the worship team are supposed to write, it's not for them. It's not even for us. It's for the world because it's going to be anointed, and anointing breaks the yoke. Amen? God is going to call you to do things that are very uncomfortable, because it's not for you. It's for the one next to you. It's for the one at the gas station. Yes. 
If he's calling you to be a boss or to be a supervisor or to be a president of a company or do something like that, it's not for you. It's for the people that you're going to build up to be amazing employees. Right, Tyler? Did you put that thing up there for me? Okay. So you want to show that up there? So I get to do something. Make you uncomfortable. Make me uncomfortable. God has been burning in my heart. I love women, and I love women of purpose. I believe that there's women that are not doing what they need to do because they don't feel like they can or they feel less than, or maybe they've been told, identity is like huge for me. And I grow in that every day. But God spoke to me, I don't know, about a month and a half ago, something like that. And he said, I want you to do a podcast. And I said, God, I don't do podcasts. I don't even listen to podcasts. I don't even know really what they are. It's like I've got them on my phone because, you know, it comes on your little Apple thing. I don't really, you know, a couple of them I've watched. It's kind of like, oh, that's dumb, you know, whatever. And I'm like, I don't do podcasts. And he's like, but you do now. I'm like, okay. So I talked to Esteban, and we kind of got some things going. And so I'm doing a podcast, and it's called Woman of Purpose. And so hopefully by the end of May, I think we do our first recording May 6th. This Friday? This Friday, we do our first recording, and then I don't know what's going to happen. He's going to do it out there. But I believe this. It's going to reach a sphere of women, and it's going to influence thousands of women. Not because of me, but because I said yes. And God's going God's to do with it what he wants to do with it. So you, what is it in you that God has been speaking you to do? Write that blog, write the book, write the song, apply for the promotion, start your own business, because the fruit that it's going to be, it's not for you. It's for somebody else to eat the apple. Do you guys get that? There's seeds inside of you. You don't just wake up every morning. You can do the impossible because the God of the impossible is inside of you. He will give you the, the strategy that, strategies that you need, the more seminars that you're going to do, the manuals that you're going to write. There's purpose inside of you, and it's not just to wake up every morning. I mean, you want to wake up every morning because if you don't, then, you know, you're in heaven. Hallelujah. You guys get that? He wants to breathe passion in you. He wants to breathe passion in me. And we need to say yes as a church and what he's called you to do, what he's designed you to do, what he's designed us to do. We have a vision at this church and we do the vision and that's what we do. How many know the vision? How many has memorized the vision? We had some little kids that, kids downstairs are learning the vision. You need a, we need a vision for our life. The Bible says that without vision, people run around trying to figure out what to do. So what is that we, what's our vision? We are... We are Prepare disciples. This is our vision and our purpose. Come on. We preach the gospel. Why do we preach the gospel? Because people need the Lord. And it's not preaching from a pulpit. It is sharing your heart. It's sharing your testimony. It's just telling somebody that Jesus loves them. We pastor believers. Why do we have to pastor people? Pastoring is a form, it's a way to help get somebody free, healthy, and strong. How many in here needed to be free, healthy, and strong? We work on it. We're free, healthy, and strong. We pastor them. We prepare them for great things in their life. This is the form of discipleship. This is what we do. It's the only thing that we do. I mean, we love the Lord too. You guys understand? 
the same thing for your life. There's nothing, in, nothing that you have done that has taken away the purpose that God has planted in your life. That seed that is in there. Maybe that thing that you've been running from. Some of you are supposed to teach. And what does that look like? Ask him. Amen? Make an impact what he's put inside of you. Hallelujah. What time is it? Oh, I got plenty of time. I'm ready for message number two. You guys ready? I love what Charlie Champ said. It's freed me so much. He said that your messages are not line upon line. I'm like, thank you, God. <laughs> so you guys get a smorgasbord. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I love, what, I love what, what Paul said to Timothy. He said, hey, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 1, 6, he says, Timothy, stir up the gifts that are inside of you. Your responsibility to stir up the gift. God puts a gift inside of you. Your responsibility is to fan the flame to do something with that gift. And in the Greek, that word gift is charisma, which, is, which means a gift for somebody else. Everybody wants to be a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher, so they can be great and mighty. It's not for you. It's not for you. When it becomes about you, yikes, I wouldn't want to be you. That's all I can say. We do what God has called us to do for the world. Paul says to Timothy, fan the flame, get it going. Come on, boy. And I think the reason it was is because this passion inside of Timothy was just flickering. I believe he was, he was starting to question things. Do you know that Timothy was a pastor? He was a pastor of one of the largest churches, and he was a young guy. And, and Paul is saying, Timothy, you got this, and you can do this. And he says this. He says, what's the next one? We all know that by heart. Because not, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. I think what he was saying is, Timothy, when you have that gift stirred up inside of you, there's no way that fear can attach itself to you. When I am flowing and walking and doing what that gift is inside of me, when I am walking in that fear, cannot attach itself to me. Just my interpretation. I'm probably completely wrong. You can ask Pastor Bob. This is part of identity. Your gift inside of you is a part of your identity. How many are sick of hearing about identity? You shouldn't be because the world, good Lord. You ever fill out an application or look at an application now? Used to, remember it used to be male or female. Remember that? Way back in the day? They ask all kinds of like, I identify as a computer today. I identify as somebody who wants to stay home from work. Check. I'm not trying to make fun of it, but what I'm trying to say is that we need to understand our identity is in Christ. And we have the answers for what the world needs. Amen? We've got to know who we are so that we can be Jesus to the world. You guys remember the story of David? Remember David, the little guy who was a shepherd? David is probably one of my heroes because David was overlooked. Anybody in here ever overlooked? When Jesse, or Samuel the prophet, was going to go to Jesse, the father of David, to anoint the next king. So Samuel shows up at Jesse's house. He says, okay, I'm ready to do it. So Jesse lines up all of his sons. And Samuel's like, oh, it's got to be this guy because he's the biggest and the strongest. And God's like, no, it's not. Remember that? So then he goes through all of them, and then Samuel goes, are these all of your sons? And Jess, Jesse, he's like, well, there's David, but can't be David. 
can't be David, because he's just this ruddy little guy. He's just keeping sheep, just keeping sheep. He says, go grab him. David comes. He says, that's the one. I love this verse. Listen to this verse. In 1 Samuel 16, it says, so as David stood there among his brothers, see, God himself will bring you before people if you do what you're called to do. David was called to keep sheep, but while he was keeping sheep, he actually was forming his identity. Because while he was, for, while he was keeping sheep, he was slaying lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, lions, tigers. That's what he was doing. He was, listen, David, what David was doing in the fields, David thought he was just keeping sheep. David was doing what he was doing. He was worshiping God. He was getting to know his father. He was getting to know who he was. He was okay with being a shepherd boy. He was learning to take care of the sheep. It said that any time a bear or a lion came, he would grab it and he would beat it to death. Can you imagine grabbing a lion? No. David did it. True story. Not only lions, but tigers and bears. But what was happening, listen, what was happening was David, while he was doing that, was preparing to kill a giant. See, you don't understand where you're at right now. You want to hurry up and kill your giant, and God is like, wait a minute, I'm preparing you here while you're tending the sheep, where nobody sees you, where nobody knows who you are, where nobody even has a clue. You guys ever watch the, what's the show, Karate Kid and Mr. Miyagi? The old one, not the new one. Okay, every, okay. Do you guys remember when Daniel, he was being bullied? This kid was being bullied by a bunch of kids from school. Daniel, one, the, Mr. Miyagi, he finds out that Mr. Miyagi knew karate. So he's like, hey, will you teach me karate? Mr. Miyagi's like, Daniel's son, I'll teach you karate. Remember? Okay. So he says, come in the morning. So Daniel gets ready, and he gets over there in the morning, and he hands him a paintbrush and a bucket. He says, Daniel's son, paint the fence. So Daniel's like, okay. So he paints, the, and then he shows him. He goes, you paint the fence, up, down. You guys remember that? Up, down, up. And then the other hand, same. Remember? So he paints the whole fence. I mean, it is a huge fence. Daniel can hardly move. He goes home, comes the next day. He's ready to learn karate. He gives him sanders. He says, go sand the floor. He goes, sand the floor? He goes, sand the floor. Daniel's son, remember? You guys got to watch it. It's good. Leaves, sands all his whole deck. I mean, it was huge. Then he comes the next day. It might be in a different order. I don't know what order it is. Then he goes, okay, I'm ready to learn karate. Daniel's son whacks the car, so he's thinking, oh, okay, wax on, wax off, wax on, wax off, remember? And he says, you do it in those motions, so he's like, okay, so he goes and he's waxing the car. So finally, David, or Daniel is frustrated, and he's like, I thought you were going to teach me how to do karate. He was just mad, he was, Mr. Miyagi, Daniel's son, what he was doing is he was training him karate, and he didn't even know it. See, the things that you're going through in your life are training you and teaching you to kill giants. But if you spend time complaining about the season that you're in, you're going to miss it. That's why it says that when you go through trials, choose joy. Because there's something I'm trying to teach you. You might be painting a fence, but really, you're going to kill a giant. I'm talking about purpose. I'm talking about understanding your identity. I'm talking about what you guys are called to do. 
With a calling comes a training, and it doesn't always look like the way that you want it to. Jesus says, in this world, you are going to have poo. But do you know that poo actually helps things grow? When I planted a garden for the first time ever, we put fertilizer on that garden. We went and took cow poop. For, I know. We took cow manure and we brought it home and we tilled it up in this garden in the ground and we had the best tomato plants we ever had. See, don't despise the things that you're going through. Don't despise the trials. Don't despise being in the fields keeping sheep. Don't get mad when somebody says, sand the floor. You're like, hey, I'm called to do this. I want to do this. And they say, here, sand the floor. Or here, go paint the fence. Or here, go clean the toilets. Do you know how many toilets I've cleaned? A lot. And I, I actually like cleaning toilets. There's nothing great than when you clean a toilet and it's nice and sparkly and smells good. Toilets can smell good. Did you know that? <sighs> David knew who he was. That's why David could stand up to a giant. Because what he learned, he tells Saul, I'm going to go and kill that giant. Saul's like, you're crazy. You're just a boy. And then he says, hey, Saul, when you were not looking, I killed a bear and I killed a lion. And this Philistine today is going to hit the ground. What was David doing? He was prophesying to Saul. He was saying, you know what? I know what you think of me, and it doesn't matter. But I know who I am. I know what I did by the power of God inside of me. And today, what I did to that lion and that bear is what I'm going to do to that giant. So Saul's like, okay. So Saul's like, here you go, David. Put this on. David puts on all of this armor. And he's walking like this. And he's like... And he's like, I can't do this because that's not how he was trained. He was trained in the fields with what? A sling and stones. So David gets his sling and he gets his stone. And this is the fun thing, is before he killed the giant, he looked at Goliath and he prophesied to him. He said, today you meet, probably not your maker, Today you die, and I'm going to cut your head off, and blah, 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 blah. He didn't run from his giant. He ran to his giant because he understood who he was, and he was trained to do it. I guarantee you David didn't know while he was in the fields keeping sheep that he was being trained. But you, some of you have gone through training. How many know there's always training to go, to, go through? It's always something new. I mean, good Lord, just get a computer. It's like, well, you got to do this. You got to do that. You gotta, and then it changes the next day. It's like, what? Apple 5, Apple 6, Apple 10, Apple 12, you know, whatever. There's always training. I love what verse 39, that was the one about the armor. David didn't learn how to fight like that. David learned how to fight when nobody was looking. I believe he learned how to fight through his worship and his praise. Amen. You guys should read about David. It's really, really amazing. He's one of my, one of my heroes. <clears throat> when we let God develop us, then it's going to be God that's going to sustain us. God develops you and me in the secret place, in the quiet place, on the backside of the desert. You know that Moses was commissioned in the wilderness? Moses was commissioned through a burning bush in the wilderness when nobody was watching. I'm sure he said, hey, guys, a burning bush spoke to me. And they're like, yeah, right. 
God's going to speak to you in those places. A lot of times he's trying to speak to you in those places and you can't hear him because you're complaining about the place that you're in. In everything, give thanks. Whatever season you're in, I want to encourage you and challenge you to give thanks. Because the Bible says if you want to know God's will, God's will is to give thanks in whatever situation that you in, you're in. So when, when you, we let God develop us, he will sustain us. We never have to try to be anything but who God has made us to be because he makes us like him and we're formed in, into the image of Jesus. Amen. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that as we behold him, we are transformed to be like him. Amen? Amy, why don't you come to the keyboard, please? What caused David to want to fight against this giant? I believe that it was David's passion about what was inside of him. What was inside of David was something that God himself placed inside of him when he was a boy, when he was being when he was being formed in his mother's womb. David actually wrote Psalm 139. I believe that there was something inside of David. It was that identity, that gift that God had put inside of him that provoked him, that passion came up within him and said, I can do this. You need, I need, we all need that, that same passion that can do that thing that God is asking us to do, that when that giant comes up, whatever that giant is in your life, and many of you already know what that is, maybe some of you are good, you're not, you don't have a giant yet, you'll probably have one tomorrow, sorry. Because we all are gonna have them, right? But you have what's in you to be able to defeat that giant because you were just in training ground, amen? I believe that David's passion for his identity and I know that nothing could stop him. Nothing would be able to stop him. And that right there, I believe, started David's journey because not too long after that, Saul was out to kill David. And David was running for his life. You were born with a purpose. Some of us have taken different roads. <laughs> Anybody in here ever take a wrong turn? And when you got your little GPS on, and you're like, you turn in to go get gas, you know, and you still got the little thing on, and she's like telling you what to do. <laughs> All men understand that. trying to tell him what to do. Anyways, nobody got that. See, there's a Holy Spirit inside of us that's going to redirect us. It doesn't matter how far down the road we go off track. We might go 50 miles out of the way. But the Holy Spirit is always speaking, saying, recalculating, 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 recalculating. The Holy Spirit hasn't changed his mind about what he's put inside of you. And it doesn't matter how far you have gone. You can't go too far to make God say, oh, he can't do it. Doesn't matter. All it takes is for you to say, turning this thing around and I'm going the right way. Laying it down before him, Romans 12, 1 says, giving yourself as a living sacrifice. Repentance takes you right back up, just like you never did it. Isn't that good? God is so good. So there's things inside of you that he wants you, not me, to stir up. I, you know, I can encourage you, and I can encourage you, and I can encourage you, and I can encourage you, but I don't want to encourage you. 
I want to empower you. Because I can encourage you today, you can wake up tomorrow and need more encouragement, but when I empower you, it's putting responsibility on you to do it. You know that we can get addicted to encouragement. We can. But when you're empowered, it's in your court. And I empower you because you have the spirit of the living God on the inside of you. He's not only on the inside of you, but he will come upon you. The God of the universe that holds the, the galaxies in the palm of his hand, that God, you know when the earth was formless and nothing, that God that spoke it and it went, Pew! wouldn't you like to see that? Like, wouldn't you like to see that? He wants to. He's like, sure, I'll see it. That God, listen, lives inside of you. There's no addiction too hard to break. There's, there's nothing that is impossible. I don't care what your situation looks like. With God, there's nothing that is too hard for him. There's nothing that is too hard for you. That's why I love cell groups. I love community. Together, we can do anything with God. Amen. Why don't you guys stand up? Just to kind of recap, if I can remember, I talked about us being a church united in what we believe and what the Bible says, standing for truth, because now more than ever, we cannot be politically correct. We need to be truth. The world does not need your opinion. Listen to me. The world doesn't need your opinion. The world needs truth. The world needs what the Bible says, not trying to make it so that they're okay and you don't hurt their feelings. I'd rather hurt their feelings now than them die and go to hell. Amen. We stand for truth because that is what we become born again to do. Amen? And there's things inside of you. There's seeds inside of you. There's books inside of you. There's things inside of you that you know that God has called you to do. Remember the apple tree. It's for somebody else to eat. Amen? The books, the CDs, not CDs anymore. What do we do now? Pod oh, yeah, podcasts. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> you can see how excited I am about it. <laughs> I'm really, I really am excited about it. But there's things. Maybe, there's, maybe you're going to be asked to speak at something. Maybe somebody's going to ask you to write a blog about something. I don't know. Maybe you're going to do the boys and girls thing that you do that's so amazing and in Barron. She does this after school program, Karen does, in Barron for these kids, and she teaches them the Bible. She teaches them about Jesus. You know, that might be the only time those kids ever hear about Jesus because she becomes inconvenienced to go sit at a school with kids that are probably not very well behaved and teaches them about the love of God. Some of us need to be inconvenienced. You've got gifts inside of you that we need. Use your gifts to serve. Do this. Yes. Fear keeps you from doing what God has put inside of you because you're afraid to fail. Do you know that you cannot fail? The only people that fail are the ones that never get up. You ever teach your kid how to ride a bike? Do they even ride bikes anymore? Okay, they do. Okay, good. I wasn't sure. I don't know. 
But I remember teaching our boys how to ride a bike and they had the training wheels on there, you know, and, and they'd ride the bike, you know. Then they get to be a little big and you think, well, you got to take the training wheels off. Just take the training wheels off and you got to kind of run behind, you know. And then you let go and then they wobble and they fall. And then you say, oh, loser. <laughs> Put the training wheels back on. You can't do anything. <laughs> of course not. We say, good job, honey. You made it this far. All right, let's get up. Let's get up. Dust that off. Get back on. And we do it again, right? And then we let them go. And we're like cheering them on, going, yes, you can do it. Yes, you got it. Yes, they did it. They went up the hill. Yes. That's the Holy Spirit with you. But you have to want to get on the bike. And he will run with you. I wasn't doing that when my kids were like 16 holding the bike while they were riding the bike. Right, cutie? Boy, that little guy's cute. Distraction. <clears throat> right? He just wants you to get on the bike. Trust him with the thing that's inside of you because he put it in there for the ones around you so they can eat the amazing apples. Write the book. Be a testimony. Maybe it's just to share your testimony. Maybe it's, may, you know, some of you in here have got crazy, crazy testimonies of God redeeming you from a place that people need to hear because that testimony can be the very thing that sets somebody else free. You guys understand? Step out. Take a risk. Amen? You can do it. And then go paint the fence. I know karate. That's how I learned karate. Mr. Miyagi. No, I'm kidding. All right. You guys are getting tired. Put your hands out like you're going to receive something. Lord, we just thank you. God, we thank you for your word, that your word is truth. God, I thank you for all the seeds that I see out. God, I thank you for the ones that are watching online, Lord, that they would, that they would grab a hold of this as well. That they would understand that they've got things inside of them that they need to stir up. They need to get the pencil out. They need to take the time to write the book. They need to take the time to go and apply for the job or start their own business or do what it is, God, that the thing that's in, inside of them. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would just come upon them right now. That more than anything, that you would make yourself real to them. God, the ones that have a testimony, Lord, of the, of the power of redemption, the power, God, that you've set them free from something, Lord, that they would be brave enough to stand up and to give that testimony to help set somebody else free. God, I thank you that David was such an example to us, that you trained him, that you trained him when nobody was watching he was doing the thing that nobody, maybe nobody even wanted to do. But from what I read, David did it with joy and with excitement. And he used that season to learn who he was and to learn who you, was, you were. And he killed lions and bears. And it was training to kill his giant and he didn't even know it. So God, I thank you for all these giant slayers here tonight. God, I thank you that they're going to pick up the tools, that they're going to do what, they're going to take the sling and the stones and they're going to kill their giants because they're going to understand who they are. God, I don't encourage them tonight, God, but I empower them. I empower the ones that are watching online that you've got the spirit of the living God living inside of you 
He gives you the power to do anything that comes before you. Jesus, we love you. We love you, and we thank you for being so patient with us. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for recalculating as we get on the right path, the right direction. Is there anyone here that maybe you have, you're just going in a different direction and you know that is, you're not really backslid, but not really front slid either. Like you are kind of going your own way, but your heart really is not to. Like you really want to walk with the Lord. You really want to do what he's called you to do. You really want to do what's inside of you, but there's something that is stopping you. If that's you, I want you just to raise your hand. right so God I just ask for the courage that you would give these guys courage to be able to do what's inside of them God I break off all fear I break off all doubt I break off condemnation God I break off the things that maybe were spoken to them Lord maybe maybe they made a mistake and people just said those things over them like you'll never do anything you can never do that do you know that chris tomlin was told that he could he couldn't sing chris tomlin was the one that wrote how great is our god he was told that he couldn't but he did it anyways so lord i thank you for the courage that they need to do what they need to do to make an impact in the influence around them for your glory. So Jesus, we love you and we thank you. Ask that you bless the people, Lord, tonight in their sleep. Give them supernatural, crazy dreams. In Jesus' name, amen.